This community led us to a conversation with the BD Council, and there was a lot of questions on your forum that uh, th there was actually way more than we could handle with the amount of time that we had to speak with them, but we picked out the ones that were the most important ones. Anything you'd like to share about that interview? There had been sort of this prevailing sense of mass confusion in the industry, and um, a lot of people on the forum were like, I'm sorry, we're supposed to have an industry approved plan, but we're not regulated. Like who's putting forth this plan? And then someone would say like, oh, beauty council. And then people would be like, who, who the hell's beauty council? So having that interview is great. Just like getting, knowing like who some of the board members are, like what their function has been. I, I thought it was a really good timing and a really good idea because there there's a lot of confusion around it. You know, they've been they've been chugging along and, and I appreciate the work that they put in for sure. And uh, for people to not know who they are, just usually it's it's a, a matter of like proximity or age or amount of time in the industry. Um, and then I know they have some baggage, but of course, people can can change and can grow and whatever. So so I think it was really cool that that you would bring them on to just provide some clarity about who they are. It, it, there's so many different areas. I, I wish we could be more helpful, but um, I mean, beauty councils, they run a little bit differently, different provinces. Uh, ours obviously runs a little bit different, but I think the biggest challenge is ever since the hair community became deregulated, they went from being an official association where they were the go-to place for everybody, hairdressers, beauty, beauticians, uh, provincial people, to an information center. So they don't have the same pull, like pull or, yeah. or authority in some areas. And I think that's where right. the confusion is for some stylists. Anybody at this point could start their own association and call it their own. So right. we know we know that they're trying that they're trying their best and that that's all we could do at this point, just like you are. And the, at the end of the day, it's just bringing people together. We're not here for a long time. Our lives are going to be over like that. So we have to make it a good one. Yeah. Well, yeah. hopefully not not too fast. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. want a virus if I can help yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. If there was an ultimate association or a group that would support all industry categories, we're talking hair, nail, uh, massage, everything beauty related, that would make you ridiculously proud to be part of them. What kinds of things would they be doing today? What would that association or that hair group look like? Good question. Yeah, like, like it's like, oh, I got to go pick up my child. I can't. I got to go to this hair association because... Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can't hear you. <laughs> That's a deep one because it's always easier to, to critique than, than create. I don't particularly have any complaints at this moment. I love the community. I think Beauty Council is doing what they're doing and, and it's good for the industry to some extent. And um, I, I, I'm not sure what I would want further right now. And I think that's why I'm not sure what, what the future of the community is exactly because cause I would want to... Um, like access the community for, for feedback rather than like decide myself. Like, I think we can, we can operate as a unit. More connection with the community and more voices of the community speaking up. It sounds yeah. like, right. Like if, if nobody speaks up, then no change happens. And I think over the last 10 years, that's pretty much what's been happening is that everybody just continues doing what they're doing. And no, and like you said, it's like, it's much easier to complain than create. So everybody's willing to point fingers, but nobody's willing to actually step up and, and, and voice some change too, or just even come up with ideas. I wouldn't mind having a solid source that was there and accessible to everyone working in our industry for the answers, like the hard and fast answers to some very serious questions. Because one thing that's always kind of plagued me a little bit about this industry is um, realizing how many people who work in the hair industry are maybe being like a teeny tiny bit exploited, um, mm, yeah. work really, really hard, not seeing pay stubs even with the breakdown of what their services were to see if they could get commission. So I would love to have like a big book that was there for people to access that said like, is it legal to charge a, a product fee on top of you know, this and that for your, yeah. like, the salon owners have to pay the EI for their chair renters, like, uh, because yeah. there are, there is so much dissent within the group. There's always two minds. Like we realized when the, when the shutdown first happened, there was a huge debate on the hair page. Oh, chair renters, do you still have to pay rent if you can't work? Mm -hmm. And there was one mind where it's like, yes, if you, um, even if you can't work, you want the salon to stay open, you want a job to come back to you, you have to keep paying 
your rent. And there was another mind that was like, if you can't access the space and if you've been laid off to, to get on the um, Curb. emergency response sure. benefit or uh, EI or whatever, then why should you have to pay rent? And there was no one there to say like, this is the answer. So if we had some sort of a governing body or a, a council or a coalition that was able to say like, here's the legit answer to that question. I feel like that might help the beauty council wasn't able to answer that or they didn't try you really hit the mark i think a lot yeah. of others were entitled to this like i'm not paying rent and all like for me myself i i know it affected my vision of what i was going back to and i had to make a lot of changes for my business so i feel like you're you're hitting the mark like it, it's it's annoying that our industries individuals will change the perspective of what their actual position is just to to better themselves is what's kind of ha sad. It's like you want to be an independent business owner, but you don't want to take any of the responsibilities of being an independent business owner. Well, Misty and I frequently, um, before the pandemic, the topic would come up where it would be like, oh, like I'm, I have a chair renter at my salon who thinks she's going on mat leave, but like she's a contractor, so she doesn't get EI. And then we would come on and say like, actually she is supposed to kind of get we'll EI. And then the owner, like owners will be like, well, no, like they're self-employed. And then there'll be a huge debate. Like the conversation will blow up and people will come from all angles and be like, no, I got them to sign this form or I got this. And you can post as many links to the government websites and like it actual says it very plainly <laughs> must pay EI for your chair renters. Um, but people will argue it till their, their faces turn blue and there's no place to turn so um, what happens if they're caught not paying it, it, just, it just doesn't seem like they ever are caught not paying no, i don't know that's the thing, that's the yeah. thing too because there's like it's it, we are a bit of a forgotten industry in terms of the structure around everything so and because there's so many gray areas there is a lot of confusion and so yes it would be great to have some sort of something that, that gave the real answers but um at this point it's it's funny that that we we can't find them when they're actually there yeah, yeah. You know it I mean? should it like should we can be still coming... disagree even though it's actually clear yeah, yeah it should be coming from the association that's what they're there for in my opinion mm -hmm. were they ever reached out to and asked or i'm not cause... sure we didn't particularly because we are paying ei for our chair renters obviously so so yeah. it didn't occur to us to to reach out on behalf of other my... or, or people who are not willing to uh come around anyway yeah. with my understanding isn't it uh if they're incorporated, they don't need to pay EI. They would have to cover their own uh, EI. But if they are sole proprietors, uh, that you, you have to cover their EI. Is that something that you guys looked into? I did not. That's a good yeah, question. That's something that something I recently looked into. If you're incorporated, um, like again, it's still a lot of gray. But if you are mm -hmm. if your chair renters are incorporated, it's up to them to actually pay their EI because with an incorporation, you're not paying EI. They don't get EI unless they're contributing. So mm -hmm. for myself, that is something that I made a change uh, for my independent stylist. I really made it known that incorporation is the only way to become independent right. fully. So that way it is separated that way. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. yeah. Okay. But it's also like better business bureau is more important. You know, like they're not they're not running their businesses properly. And that's where I think more people I hate saying whistleblowers, but there almost needs to be a little bit more of people complaining to the better business bureau saying you know, these are the things that are happening, especially when you hear, you know, young stylists coming into the industry, getting abused as assistants or even practicum students. That's the biggest thing that I would love to see is change is when students go in hair schools, hair schools need to do a little bit of a better job sending them to salons that are actually going to benefit their education, not make them feel like shit going through the two week practicum and then coming out being like, why should I even do this industry or be in this industry when I'm treated like shit? And then they go into a salon and then all the senior stylists treat them like shit because they were treated like shit. And then yeah. it's like, it's just this end, it never just ending perpetuating load. negativity. Totally. Yeah, you, and then, you don't know anything about being treated like shit as an apprentice, do you? <sighs> Could that possibly be a reason why some junior young hairstylists are becoming molded in a certain way that might not progress the industry as a whole? I mean, that is a, that's a domino effect. That's a good point, Franco. Yeah. I think that it's, um, I mean, I've worked at two salons in my entire career. So 
uh, I started at the salon where Missy and I met. And when I left that salon, I moved to the Beehive as a chair renter. I had two bosses and three years into working there, one of my bosses was retiring and moving to the Sunshine Coast. And um, my other boss asked me to come on as her partner. So I've been at the Beehive for this December will be 14 years. And um, so my experience in the industry is like, I found a salon where I was um, as a chair renter, like empowered with knowledge, where my bosses were transparent with me, where I was treated with respect, where I was given the opportunity to work hard and keep the majority of my own profits and my chair rent, what it was going to was, was transparent and clear to me. Um, where I didn't feel like I was being exploited, where I had a cohesive, positive work environment. And I was like, I'm going to work here till my hands fall off. And so when I was given the opportunity to buy in as an owner, I was like, duh, like I was 28 years old. And I to think about that. Like, of course I'll do it. Um, not even realizing later, like the, the implications that like owning a salon and having a commercial lease and all that stuff would entail. But um but being then going into being an employer and seeing like what like knowing what my initial experience in the industry was and how um i may or may not have been uh not treated super great as an apprentice and voluntold to do a lot of things outside of the scope of my job and stuff like that um we want to know their names where they live their <laughs> <driver's license. laughs> Like a lot of the younger staff that I have these days, like since the industry is being deregulated, like a lot of people are graduating from, um, you know, six month or five month programs uh, with very little mentorship that, you know, um, they feel lucky to get a job anywhere that will throw them a scrap of education. And a lot of the education that we're getting now is all brand based. And it's not like it used to be where it's like you you actually get in depth into the science, like how what actually makes this hair color work? What actually makes this hair product do this to your hair? It's like we have this patented molecule and it makes hair shiny and clients love it. And that's all you need to know. Um, and so like we're raising these stylists where like they have to keep this job because they feel super lucky that they got it. They're getting a fully branded education in one tiny corner of of the industry and then they're scared to leave their job because they only know that brand they only know that line their boss is the one who taught them how to do baby lights nicely or whatever and they feel beholden to them um so yeah i i feel like um a move towards like more open dialogue more access to information more access to like what your rights are um and more access to like what actually makes hair function and like what are the the things behind the things that we use every day like what makes this product work like that what makes hair color work like this and that instead of like what says it does or what says it does or what says it does that would be a dream that would be amazing because I feel like young stylists then wouldn't stay in these jobs where they're getting mistreated and abused like they have a trade we're tradespeople you know, like we are legit tradespeople. And so like being a journeyman in your trade should mean that you feel confident going into any workplace and practicing what you do. Yeah. I think and it, this has been like my... service. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. You're go all ahead. like, yes. <laughs> but I think being in service is a different kind of cultural shift. It's like, we're always trying to please the client. We're always trying to please, the, you know, our coworkers or, you know, and it, it can reach a bit of a boiling point when you get really sick of it and you get burnt out and a lot of people are getting burnt out as well. Mm -hmm.